Hi, welcome to the Hole in the Head Moto Storytime Podcast. I'm Andy, and I have a lot of old motorcycles. Some people in my life might say too many, but each one has its own little story of how I found it and returned it to service, sometimes after years of neglect. This podcast recalls some of my adventures into the completely unnecessary pursuit of filling the garage with obsolete, loud, and smelly machines. Maybe you can relate. Welcome to Hole in the Head. This episode is called Mommy Dearest, an ironic nickname for my mother who couldn't be more polar opposite than the 1981 Joan Crawford biopic. As you'll see, she's actually been more like a partner in crime, uh, an enabler, really, in my vintage motorcycle pursuits, but we'll get into more of that later. My first experience with a Moto Guzzi was with a later model, the Quota, an odd name for a motorcycle model, but Italian's. I used to share a shop with a small community of DIYers, and one day, the eldest and arguably most experienced of any of us brought in his weird, tan, dual sport, and within an hour had the entire thing stripped down to the engine case to replace some seal or another, and had it buttoned back up before we left for the day. I wasn't very familiar with Guzzi's heritage, but I asked him how he liked working on it. He sort of dismissively said, ah, you know, it's a tractor engine. I chuckled a little, but... If I'm honest, I didn't have a clue what he meant. For all I know, Moto Guzzi used to make tractors. I mean, if Ducati started out making radios, why not? Curiosity would eventually get the better of me, and then I had to have a transverse twin. I mean, other than my very first bike, a Honda CX500. When I did, I finally got the joke. Moto Guzzi's are simply designed, and they're nearly indestructible. I've grown to love the Guzzi brand, mostly because of this simplicity. They're generally easy to work on, they're not terribly complicated, and for the most part, they're reliable. The Moto Guzzi company has had some financial ups and downs, but the iconic shaft drive 90 degree V-twin engine has remained largely unchanged since the early 1960s. It's been incorporated into a wide range of offerings, from the V7 Sport in 1967 through to the contemporary Norgays and Stelvios. Though, of course, the latter are much more technically advanced, the setup is the same. I had the opportunity to visit the original Moto Guzzi factory in Mandelo Delario on an extended trip to Italy a couple of years ago. And while that can be its own episode, what I will tell you is that the entire town lives and breathes Moto Guzzi, and it has been doing so for nearly a hundred years. For me, that just perpetuates the brand's apparent mindset of, if it's not broke, don't fix it. This story is about my 1972 V750, or Ambassador. It may not have been designed with an American audience in mind, but if you put it next to a contemporary Harley, you'll see the similarities. Long, low, heavy cruisers that eat up miles comfortably. It's also notable that Guzzi created a police version for the California Highway Patrol. But anyway, enough of that. I hope you enjoy this episode. Mommy Dearest. I cast a wide net in my Craigslist searches. After all, why should something as piddly as a few thousand miles keep you from at least knowing what's out there? I've found great deals on really hard to find projects in completely different time zones, and while I couldn't move on it, I passed along the info when I could through Twitter or Facebook because, by God, someone needs to get over there and pick up that Triumph GT6 or the Perilla project. One fall evening, I was flipping through the usual notifications and saw a listing for a very dusty, fairinged out tourer scheduled for an estate sale in North Dallas, vaguely titled Moto Guzzi Bike. I could see that it was an ambassador, the slightly smaller 750cc brother to the Eldorado's 850. The price was right, but the timing and the location were not. The Ambo was up for public sale only on the following Friday morning, and there would be no holding on the part of the seller. First come, first served. I've evolved a certain level of acceptance at the multitude of deals that I can't get to, but this one was actually near my hometown, where my mom still lives. 
surely we can make something happen. Now, my mother is awesome, if only because she's always been a good sport with my weird or normal interests and hobbies. Like when I collected baseball cards as a kid, she'd haul me to some hotel convention center on the other side of Dallas for a trade show, or during my comic book phase, which may still be ongoing, she'd patiently wait in the car while I poured over bins of old clearance books or drooled at the collectible ones behind the counter of the one comic book store in our hometown. True to form, she humors me even now by asking about my recent auto or moto acquisitions, and I'll share my recently acquired knowledge on the history and peculiarities of any given mark or model and really just practice my justification of why I've picked up yet another non-running vehicle. This sale was in a particular area of North Dallas, which was at a residence not far from her office. I also knew that her boss, for whom she's now worked for more than 20 years, would quickly forgive tardiness if it had to do with a ridiculous motorcycle errand. He and I have shared a few motorsports stories, and he's got a pretty amazing collection himself. I gave her every opportunity to say no to my crazy proposal, but when I suggested she pop into the sale to recon the situation, she was in. Easily. Because if nothing else, it looked like they may have some really neat antiques. Here's some more you need to know about my mother. She's short. Exactly five feet tall. With wispy blonde hair and a little frame that's, we'll say, top heavy. In her younger days and even now, that stereotypical busty blondness was a foil for her extreme decency and common sense. At first blush, she's pretty easygoing, maybe even unassuming, but, and maybe because she's a Leo, she can be a lion when she needs to be. She is savagely loyal. Her pride is paramount in every sense of the word. And while her height might make her easy to overlook, underestimating her won't do you any favors. And I say all that because it makes what she did on Friday all the more impressive. On Thursday night, all the pieces were in place. I had called the estate guy and told him to expect my agent, i.e. my firecracker mom, in my place to see the bike. He still wouldn't sell it early. Mom was going to get to the sale a few minutes before it opened, and I had a tow service on speed dial if things went well. Mind you, I'm two hours behind Dallas time, so I was only mostly awake at 6.30 when she called to tell me that she had arrived at the sale to see a line from the front door of the house all the way to the sidewalk. She got in line anyway, that bit about loyalty, and after some inevitable Texas, we're all in line together chit chat, it turned out that the big loud guy in front of her was there for the goozy. First come, first served. The cards didn't seem to be stacked in our favor. However, to continue that metaphor, she kept her cards close and didn't reveal her intentions. If I know her at all, she probably said something like, oh, that's neat, and maintained her appearance of just some sweet lady here for the antiques. No threat to a big man about to do a deal on a motorcycle. We checked in via text every five minutes or so until the sale started. At 9.07, she replied, you want it? She used the letter U, omitting the Y and the O. And I didn't need any explanation. I replied, yes, please, opting for PLZ instead of spelling out please. At 9.15, she called me with the whole story. As the line filed into the sale, the dusty goozy was largely sidestepped for all the housewares and fabulous antiques until the would-be buyer big man gave it a good once-over and asked the seller if they'd take anything less than the asking price. Of course, having just opened the sale, the seller said no, but big man played it cool and did a, I'm thinking about it and I don't want to seem interested, sort of stroll around the sale. Then, the short, unassuming blonde grabbed the seller's attention and quietly declared, I'll take it. I like to think that the seller immediately recalled the phone call he had the day before with some dude in Seattle and smiled. They shook hands, and she turned her attention to the carnival glass in the corner that was calling her name. Big man pushed his way through the shoppers to plead his case of dibs, but the deal had been done. His plan of hardball had backfired. Sorry, buddy. Mom bought a few other things that she didn't need, apparently a hereditary trait, and the seller agreed to hold the bike until the next day. And the pickup wasn't very noteworthy, except to pass along this little tip. AAA does not endorse this show, but they are a fantastic resource for those of us who often need to pick up non-running vehicles. But my assumption of their usefulness in this case was a disappointment. The account holder must be present when a vehicle is towed. More precisely, Don't tell them you won't be there. But luckily there was a tow company I could get over last minute. I was worried that the bike would be too big of a bear for her to handle, but sure enough, 
mom was able to charm the driver into not only getting the dirty, flat-tired beast of a bike up onto its center stand, but also clearing out some space in the garage at her house. In two months, I would drive from Seattle for Christmas, pulling a small rented trailer, eager to meet my new Italian friend and bring it home. And of course, see my family and wait for Santa Claus. But any downtime during the rest of the visit was spent in the garage, diagnosing what it would take to get it running and practicing restraint and taking things apart before I could get it back to Seattle. The bike was in full dress with a pinstriped Wixom fairing, which I still think looks like something Batman designed that shrouded a custom dashboard with AM FM radio and CB tucked between the gauges. It sported a punch label sticker that read, Hogs are dogs. This thing is so awesome. There seems to have been a population in the 70s and 80s that sort of defiantly stood out among the one percenters. It was a cadre of motorcycle guys, not Hell's Angels, but not necessarily one of the nicest people you might find on a Honda. They had bikes like this weird Europeans that were niche and anomalies among the crowds of American steel you see at Sturgis. Luckily, time has been great to this ambassador. When I got into the shop, I began disassembly and inspection. The engine was free and the cylinders were in great condition, though the diehard goozy guys online insisted that the cylinders were ticking time bombs unless upgraded to the spendy Nicosil kit. Probably, but while throwing money around can solve a lot of potential or perceived problems, there would be plenty of time for upgrades after the basics were met. The original generator was tired and needed a new belt. An option was a $400 alternator conversion, but I opted to just rebuild it for $7. The first startup involved large pieces of rusty exhaust baffle flying out of the muffler and chipping the paint on my truck. I should probably replace the silencers, but I kind of like the note. But um, but um, but um, but um, but um. My first ride was with a crazy uncle-type friend who I've known for decades. He was visiting Seattle in his incredibly tricked-out Harley whatever a glide, which, or really whom, he refers to as Priscilla. If the speed limit were as fast as you can, then it would not have worked, but we kept an easy 70 mile an hour pace and I enjoyed riding giant cruisers with my friend. At the end, we stopped at a car wash so he could detail his chrome, and while waiting, I just gave the gas tank a good wipe and caught Pokemon on my phone. My Garage Sale Guzzi is my favorite bike. It's a blast to ride and it sounds like a diesel truck, but to be honest, it's really because my mommy got it for me. I just hope that if my daughter ever calls me one day and asks me to do something as ridiculous as take time off of work to stand in line for something as ridiculous as an old motorcycle, I want to have my mother's same sense of adventure and why not attitude, knowing that we're still creating stories together. Because now, being on the other side of parenthood, I'm getting a sense of how special and precious those stories are. Being a father has given me a tiny bit of retroactive insight that it didn't matter if my interest was baseball cards or comic books or Italian motorcycles. In my case now, it's unicorns and serving cookies to stuffed animals because those things are crazy exciting for my little girl right now, who has already claimed this Moto Guzzi as her own. Just physically showing up is the foundation for any story and it can often be enough tinder to spark joy for others. Time spent in participation is fleeting and finite, so I'm extremely grateful for the things I get to participate in with the people that I love, even from 2,000 miles away. And that's the truth. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Look for new stories soon about other bikes and projects like the Landspeed Two Stroke or my Flintstone Fiat. Also, this show is about sharing stories and I'd love to hear yours. I'm working on a message system, but until then, email me at stories at holeintheheadmoto.com or holler at me on Instagram at holeintheheadmoto. And one last thing. 
If you like the Storytime podcast so far, hit subscribe. It really goes a long way in getting us off the ground. I'm Andy. Thanks again. Which one are you on? This. Which one is that? My Goozy. That's a Moto Goozy? You ride in Moto Goozy. You ride the W. I'll ride the dub. I'll ride the BMW. Okay. You ride, you ride the Goozy. Okay. Okay, careful. Rum, rum. Rum, rum. Moto Goozy!